Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this open forum from IGF to GDC, a new era of global digital governance, a SIDS perspective, organized by the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. The CTU is a treaty-based intergovernmental international organization dedicated to promoting and supporting the development of the Caribbean Information and Communications Technologies, ICT, and that sector for the socio-economic development of the region. This open forum is to share specific experiences and advance discussions on issues of global inequality in the new digital global economy within the context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals 8, 9, and 10, and to help developing countries formulate specific proposals and recommendations for the Global Digital Compact as they prepare for the future of the World Summit. We must ensure that the GDC takes into account the shortcomings of the UN IGF process, specifically as it relates to DCs and SIDS, and identifies opportunities and mechanisms to address those shortcomings. All of these issues are addressed in this open forum, are issues that the Caribbean is currently grappling with, and which present major social and economic development challenges for the region. Interaction between on-site and online speakers and attendees will be facilitated via an online moderator, and that person will flag questions, comments, and other actions of online participants to the on-site moderator. So let's get started. Our guests this morning are, let me start with myself. My name is Joel Ford. I am the mo on-site moderator, and Marius, Michelle Marius is the online moderator. Our guests this morning are next to me, Mr. Rodney Taylor, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Sylvia Cadena, sorry, Sylvia's not with us. Olga Cavalli, co-founder of the Director of the South School on Internet Governance. Mr. Quinton Shu Lambert, Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. And Tracy Hackshaw, who is the President of the Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. Online, we have Mr. and Ms. Serena Teleno, Director of Knowledge, the Diplo Foundation. Online, we've got Mr. Otis Osborne. He's the acting head HOD of Department of Information Technology at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, and Mr. Shernan Osepa, Internet Governance and Cybersecurity Policy Advisor. So once again, good morning, everyone. We want this to be a robust discussion and interactive, so please feel free to join in. But I'm gonna start with the opening remarks. Um, what are the main internet governance challenges you believe have been facing SIDS and how has the IGF served as a platform to mitigate those challenges? And I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, good morning, and thanks for joining us for this uh, discussion this morning. Um, with respect to the challenges facing SIDS, I think the part of the, the challenge, uh, I would say, is the ability, the, the ability to actively participate in the processes that have been ongoing now um, since 2005. Um, the, the fact is that we're s small island developing states. There are resource constraints, um, or financial resources, human resources. And therefore, even though the IGF is a multi-stakeholder uh, process, which means that anyone can participate, I mean, as long as you're online, uh, as a matter of fact, even if you're not online, you can, you can participate, you can come and uh, make your voice heard. But there's, a, there's still barriers to entry, as it were. There's a cost to coming here to Kyoto. Um, there's, there's even if you access remotely, you need to still be brought up to speed to, with the issues. And um, you'll see many of the panelists here are actively involved. I mean, I, I use Tracy Hackshaw, who's on the panel here, as a, as a poster child for IGF participation because he's been active for a long time. I mean, really active, sitting on on um, on, on boards, um, not just within the IGF, but in other processes like ICANN and so on, uh, and Aaron. So, so if we can get uh, ten more, like Mr. Hackshaw, I think the region would be well represented. But reality is that most people, uh, including Tracy and myself, have a day job. So while we we are happy to come here and talk and discuss. Um, reality is that we do have other r duties and responsibilities, and the IGF is, is well recognized as a place where people can where people come and talk and discuss and we network and so on. And there's value in that, um, but it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, actionable 
uh, outcome and therefore you have to start asking uh, the value proposition of the investment that is being made to participate. So I'll stop there for now, but those are some of the challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. And I'll move over to Serena Talanu. Serena. Thank you. Uh, just building on what Rodney was saying, uh, what we're seeing in Geneva, and yeah, maybe I should start with the context. Um, I work in Geneva a lot with missions of countries there, and you know, Geneva is one of the hub of um, digital diplomacy, um, internet governance, internet policy, a lot is happening there with ITU and a bunch of other organizations discussing internet and related issues. And what we're hearing a lot from missions of um, small developing countries, and paradoxically also from larger countries, is that there's a lot going on and it's impossible to follow everything. So there is this big challenge of keeping an eye on everything happening and then meaningfully contributing, as you were saying. And another um, challenge they're facing is the lack of capacity. There is so much going on on so many topics. One person cannot be an expert into everything. So the question is how do you build institutional capacities, um, in this case across um, governments, but also across other stakeholder groups. Um, to what extent the IGF has managed to mitigate some of these challenges? Um, I think there have been efforts and um, even the whole idea of having an IGF where people get together to try to learn a bit more from each other is a good thing. But then again, there's so much going on and you have to make a choice. And again, speaking about governments, um, I think we're seeing this is a challenge for the IGF. Not many governments actually show up. Um, let's see if the GDC can help address some of these challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Uh, Tr Tracy, Akshel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I in this session, I'm representing the Trans-Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, which puts on the Trans-Tobago IGF, but I also wear the hat as co-coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Small and Developing State of my co-coordinator sitting in the room, I'm watching her directly in front of me, Maureen Hilliard from the Cook Islands. Um, so from a positive standpoint, I, th I do think that the IGF um, can provide a space for SIDS to have their voices heard, um, especially in terms of the national and regional IGFs. The Caribbean IGF is one great example of that. Pacific IGF, I believe there's gonna be Indian Ocean IGF um, soon and then at the national level in terms of the various islands who have their own IGFs um, that can feed into the, nas the, the national, regional, and, and global IGF. Um, but of course there are challenges. So even though we do have the Dynamic Coalition, we do have these IGFs resources, as was said before, is a challenge. And the other thing that I think we need to worry about is whether or not the priorities that we place on internet issues, internet policy, even digital issues in the SIDS are given sufficient priority. As we all know, um, in SIDS, there are significant other challenges that we face, um, climate change being one of them, um, obviously infrastructural issues generally, um, economic issues and so on. Of course, other countries face that. So where we talk about something as uh, dare, dare I say esoteric as internet governance, when you approach the, the leadership in the countries, um, that has somewhat you know, shifted down the, the, the priority level. So we need to find a way to link digital and internet governance issues with the critical issues that face our country. And you know, to a large extent, that links to things like cybersecurity, um, you know, emerging threats to the econ economy, that digital brings. And if we find a way to link those two, I think we can maybe overcome the challenges using something along those lines. But we leave that discussion for later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tracy. I will now ask Mr. Quinton Shu Lambert to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it seems that some of the uh, uh, benefits of the IGF are also, you know, some the cause of the some of the issues as well. There seems to be a trade-off between this kind of federated network of networks approach, which allows the regional and um, you know local kind of consultations, with the kind of overwhelm of how many different meetings people have to go to to keep up to speed. Um, and in a case where the we we also hear in New York that 
Uh, the delegations, even in New York, are overwhelmed with many other issues, uh, including climate, uh, the debt issues. And so often the urgency of these internet governance issues can be kind of pushed down. Um, so um, I do think one of the, the benefits of the IGF is to just bring people together. And uh, I mean, this being my first IGF, I feel uh, very humbled having shared the room with people who have been here from the start since 2003 and um, almost since the birth of IGF and the WSIS action line process. And coming in and listening to all the sessions and exchanging has allowed you know me to understand more some of the issues that and some of the perspectives and that's there's a lot of value in that sharing of information and so in a world where um, some kind of political conditions are becoming more challenging this kind of networking and uh, exchange will become increasingly valuable and uh, something that I'll come back to when we come to the question around the future of the IGF um, but uh, these co comments are a little bit generic, um, but um, some of the yeah, internet governance challenges uh, and how the IGF deals with that are common with many other countries in uh, other parts of the world, parts of the developing world, LLDCs, LDCs. And um, one of the questions is how this group will come together, if it comes together, to give voice to some of its concerns in a global process. And uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Olga Cavalli to also give her remarks. Olga. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to this very interesting panel. This is my 18th IGF. I was there on, yes, I'm a, I, I've been young for so many years. Um, I was there when, when the IGF was created in Tunis in 2005. And when it was decided it was going to be in Athens and Greece. Um, I think that IGF has been a fantastic space for defining and, and creating many of the things that are in place now. Many of the changes that have been happening in the global coordination of the internet were born in discussions here. Where there is no one a specific outcome, I think that all the changes that were done uh, in the ICANN organization, the trans IANA transition, the uh, affirmation of commitments, many, many changes that are really binding were born in spaces of dialogue like the IGF. All the national and regional IGFs were born spontaneous from discussions in this space. The schools of internet governance uh, were born as a spin-off from the IGF. Now we started, the, the first it was the European, the second was ours in, in Latin America for 15, 15 years, and now there are more than 20 all over the world. And those uh, fantastic activities and s dialogue spaces, perhaps more focused in regions, sub-regions, uh, cities, or specific issues were born in the IGF. I think the IGF is a fantastic space it is, uh, sometimes people get lost. Uh, I was lost <laughs> in trying to find this room. This is why <laughs> I just came at the hour. But that's part of the beauty, uh, the, the, this creative chaos that the, the IGF bring to all of us. So um, I, I'm always positive. I think it's a great meeting. Uh, I only attended twice virtually because I couldn't travel the and then the pandemic. But uh, now I'm happy to be here again. So these are my comments for the moment. Thank you very much. We now go to our online moderator, Ms. Michelle Marius. Michelle, you're going to introduce our two online participants. Okay. Hi, good, after good evening, everyone. It's, it is um, nighttime in Jamaica where I am. Um, all right. Is it possible, um, Shonan, uh, for us to hear from you, Shonan Osepa? And then we will have um, Otis Osborne. Yes, it is possible. Good good morning, good evening to all. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and to give a contribution to the development of the internet. I think when we talk about internet governance, it's important for us to understand why we came up with all these discussions regarding internet governance. So back then, like um, around year 2000, there was a lot of confusion going on around the globe, especially governments, they didn't know what that th this thing called the internet was. So we have seen all the discussions coming up with the WSIS that finally 
did lead to um, the IGF that we that we have in nowadays. And I think when we talk about internet governance, we can always use the I I, or I like to use the the the, the baskets that the um, Diplo Foundation has been focusing on, looking at, for example, the infrastructure, security, legal, economic, social, cultural development, and human rights issues. And I think, especially SITS, small island development states, we can use these baskets as a kind of a checklist to see where we are with developments in our own different, let's say, um, jurisdictions. We should also recognize that um, it was never the intention of the IGF to come with um, um, to, to to take decisions. So it's not a decision making body, but it's more like a place where people can, can talk freely and discuss with order to see how they can come up with um, solutions. But I think the very important thing is that um, once we have discussed issues, challenges, and opportunities at the IGF, we should return home and then have some meaningful discussions with, um, let's see, let's say all stakeholders that normally do attend IGFs, because sometimes um, locally in our own jurisdictions, you would not find those persons, but at the IGF, you will find all these stakeholders. So I think, um, and once we, we return home, looking at the different countries, islands or whatever, we should say, okay, these are the challenges that we are facing in this particular jurisdiction. How can we solve these challenges that we are facing? And I think if we can focus on that, then it, it, it will add value. So although the IGF doesn't focus on, let's say for us to take um, key decisions, but once we return home, we should be able to discuss with um, all the stakeholders in order for us to address local challenges that we are focused, that we are facing. Um, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Osborne, please. Hello, Mr. Osborne. Sorry, Sorry okay. I was so muted. Okay. Well, well, for me, I think that the, for small island developing states, there's an economic barrier to digital transformation and access, especially, well, for everyone, the government, businesses, and citizens alike. Not to mention the pervasive lack of trust in digital transactions by majority of the um, medium to small, small to medium business service providers and consumers of these services. The idea, of course, plays a vital role in making recommendations and guiding discussions on internet governance. However, these discussions um, may have missed Jamaica's policy and decision makers due especially to the non-existence of a national IGF to guide initiatives on the ground. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Osborne. We come back to our on-site panelists, and the first question is, how do you see the acceptance of the Global Digital Compact, the GDC, changing the digital governance landscape and addressing global inequalities facing SIDS in the new digital global economy? I'm gonna start at the other end of the table with you, Olga. Thank you very much. We, we think this is a very interesting process. Um, we we thought that it was a good opportunity for uh, engaging the fellows of the School of Internet Governance in making a contribution. So we started an online uh, process of uh, consulting with them. So um, we received contributions from 65 fellows from 22 countries of the five continents. I will, I will share in, in the chat the, the document that we produced. Um, and uh, we, we contribute uh, focused on the seven digital issues that the Common Agenda suggested. Uh, there were comments made about one, connect everyone to the internet, including all schools, avoid internet fragmentation, protect data, which is number three, number four, apply human rights online, 
Five, introduce accountability criteria for discrimination and misleading content. Promote the regulation of artificial intelligence and digital commerce as a global public good. So this wasn't a first experiment. Uh, we we didn't do such a such an activity before, and uh, the the comments and outcomes uh, uh, finalized a very very interesting document. We translated it into three languages: Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And we send it to the Global Digital Compact. It's published now in, in their website. And for the fellows, this was really uh, a very remarkable activity. I will share with you the, the link to the document where you have the, their names with the countries of origin and, uh, and, the, and the outcome document. Um, sometimes, uh, as we were saying a, a moment before, it's overwhelming how, how to to follow all the processes. M and many, many of my students at the university also ask me that. And what I tell them is that, okay, try to focus on in, in things that you are that are important for, for, for your work and for your personal interest. We are not we cannot be experts in everything, but we cannot be interested in some of the things and follow them. So um, we are following all the activities of the Global Digital Compact and the Summit of the Future. Now with the fellows of this year, we are uh, preparing a similar document to what we did for the Global Digital Compact, for uh, contributing to the Summit of the Future and WISIS Plus 20. Now we have the experience from the first document, so we will we want to build uh, upon from, from there, and I will stop here. I will share the, the document in the chat. Thank you very much, Olga. I am going to go to next to you, Quinton. Thank you. Um, so, the Global Digital Compact is um, quite a nice complement to the IGF. And we've heard already that the IGF is maybe decision shaping, but it's not decision making. Uh, the GDC is a decision opportunity at the leaders level. So heads of government will come together next September and make a decision around how the Global Digital Compact should be, what should be inside of it. Um, the opportunity here for SIDS is to really, um, and for everyone, but especially countries who have not necessarily harvested as many of the benefits of the global digital ecosystem over the last 20 years, to maybe have a um, an updated set of concerns incorporated. So um, you know, when the WISIS action lines were first written, they were updated in 2015 for the SDGs, but there was not such a big concern around uh, data and the value of data and how data was being monetized back in 2000s. Uh, now data is, some people, you know, talk about it as a very valuable resource. And how is that monetized? How is those revenues taken into local jurisdictions? And of course, artificial intelligence is a new technology, well, not that new, but it's technical breakthroughs have happened recently, which were not available before. Um, so it's a chance to update the focus, and it's also a chance to um, upgrade the ambition around trying to uh, spread the benefits of these technologies globally um, in a way that's safe, but also then in a way that benefits all countries and um, yeah, all <laughs> all humans. Let's say um, so. One way of thinking about it is when the you know sustainable development goals were put on the table, they were a chance to reconcile the two competing goals of uh, development, economic growth, and sustainability, because we have a finite planet. Uh, in a similar way, the Global Digital Compact could be a way of trying to harness these technologies and spread the benefits around the world, but to do it in a way that it's safe and also um, benefits everyone, inclusive. So. Um, We'll see what happens with the GDC. It's in. It will be in the hands of the member states, not the UN. So, everything I say is, uh, you know, from a perspective or a kind of speculative, if you like. But uh, it is a leader-level decision, and it's a it's a rare opportunity to take some of the questions and issues that have been surfaced during the IGF discussions. Uh, some of those questions, which cannot just be handled purely by the technical community, that require high-level political decision making and um, inject them into this policy window. Thank you very much, Tracy. Same question to you. All right, so I think it's a very interesting question. 
the GDC does not exist yet. So it's a question that we, um, you know, I don't know. So what I decided to do is I went into my chat GPT and <laughs> Bard. Bard is, the answer is shorter, so I'll give, I'll give what Bard told me. So Bard told me that one of the key goals of the GDC is to promote a more inclusive and digi equitable digital world. This is particularly important for SIDS um, because it could help address global inequalities by providing SIDS with greater access to digital technologies and resources and by helping them to develop their own digital economies. Sounds good. Um, then there are some specific ways, increased access to digital technologies and resources, support for development of digital economies, strengthen digital capacity, improve digital governance and explains what those mean. And then it says overall the GDC has the potential to have a significant positive impact on digital governance and global inequalities facing SIDS by providing a global framework for digital cooperation. The GDC could help to create a more inclusive and equitable digital world for all. So that sounds like a lot of words that were just put nicely together um, because it's a large language model, right? So it just puts all the words <laughs> together. Sounds really good. What does it mean, though? And in reality, what does it mean for the, the SIDS um, populations? Um, so I think there is, I agree with it, what has been said, there is an opportunity. Um, as I said, it does not exist yet, and I'm glad you said it's the member states. Um, it's up to the member states to, to actually implement it. And again, bring it, coming back to the priorities issue, um, what it can do, I do think it can lift the priority of digital issues higher up on the agenda because it's something a little more formal, a little more, um, you know, tangible than what the IGF has been set up as, you know, sort of a discussion space. So this is, I'm not saying it's a treaty, it's not any kind of, you know, mandatory thing to happen, but at the very least, member states will agree to something and you have your, your health account. So if it is that that's what it's, it's going to be, then I would imagine, like with other types of UN um, processes, the SDGs, um, the elimination of disc uh, discrimination against women, and so on, we can find perhaps the way to report on this, to hold member states to account, especially in SIDS, and to use it to get governments to actually program these activities or what can improve the SIDS um, economy's activities into their various budgets and allow the communities in their own countries and the stakeholders in their countries to deliver upon what the digital compact um, promises. Because it's a promise, it's spe as you said, speculative, um, but once I think it's a promise, it's a promise to keep. So I do hope, and I'm being very optimistic here, that once that is happening, we can start to see a priority lift and I also would like to say that maybe the fact that it's being, you know, 2024, some into the future, there's a brand, there's some push towards it. As we talked about in our DC SID session, it's sort of an event we can mobilize around. There could be some, you know, signal activities around this that will raise the profile of these issues and make it, you know, along the same lines as our challenges that we face in terms of infrastructure and, and so on. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, Tracy. And Serena? Um, thank you. Yeah, building on what Tracy and Bard <laughs> uh, were saying. Mostly in the Bard. <laughs> mostly Bard, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, indeed, there is a lot of promise, right, and expectation in the Global Digital Compact. Looking at the question, I'm not completely sure there is indeed a goal to actually have a GDC change, the digital governance landscape. So I would skip that part of the, the question. Um, whether it will address inequality, and I think that's part of the promise and the, the potential. What I personally would like to see going towards this GDC um, is building a roadmap, but taking into account everything that had, has happened so far. So trying a bit not to reinvent the wheel and re-say all those things that Bard was saying, uh, but yet rather try to you know take things forward. Like we have uh, WISIS outcomes. We have the annual UNGA resolution on ICT for development. We have the SDGs, which to some extent um, should be relying on using technology for development. 
if we can in some way build on all this and have a G G global digital compact that is a bit forward looking, I think that would indeed help um, address some of these um, inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Serena. Rocco? Sure. Um, <coughs> I'll be very quick. I think this question also goes to the heart of the You're not hearing you. Okay. Hi. Good. <laughs> this question goes to the heart of multilateralism versus multi stakeholderism. So, in the UN, and I saw this when we, we, we actually crafted some statements for our the permanent representatives in New York who uh, from the Caribbean, so some of them were able to make interventions during the um, during the GDC deep dives uh, on various thematic areas. Um, and you, it's clear that the UN gives priority to its member states. I mean, so um, I when I speak on the floor of the UN, I speak on behalf of my country. Um, I have influence uh, within this process here. You, 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 are an attendee like everybody else, and you can f you're free to make your contributions. Um, yes, there may be some influence um, uh, if you're if you're a diplomat, but really the, the form is meant to be multi-stakeholder, and uh, everybody has an equal voice. Uh, the UN is quite a different animal. <laughs> So even though that process was, well, and it's, it's not a criticism of the process, but even though it was sought to be multi-stakeholder, um, it was clear that priority would be given or ha w was given in terms of even in accepting interventions um, by, by the member states. So now that's not necessarily a bad thing for small states because for small states, uh, and if you look at the ITU process, for example, Barbados has the same voice, the same vote as the United States, as Canada, uh, and so on, so we can influence, <laughs> right? And then there's a lot of lobbying within those processes for that very reason, all right? Um, whereas in the multi-stakeholder process, w it's all equal footing, but it's not all equal resources and participation, as I mentioned before. So the voices that show up, the voices that have the resources to show up, um, are the ones with this that, that have the potential to have a stronger influence. So. Um, there's, there's those dynamics, but I, I'm, I feel positive overall about the GDC and uh, hopefully that it leads to some positive outcomes for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodney. And Michelle, I'm going to hand over to you for your online panelists. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Otis, can you go first and then um, Shannon, please? Okay, so I agree with my fellow panelists. And I, I like to add without uh, regurgitating what was said before, is that um, there's no doubt that the world is transitioning into a new digital global economy. Well, however, for small island developing states, especially, this transition is progressing at a very slow pace. And unless governments, and I'm talking Caribbean governments, recognize um, the universal access or universal access of free internet. And I emphasize free internet as a human right because they are, they are digitizing the, um, for e-governance, However, if you do not have data on your phones, then you're not able to access that service. Also, this free internet as a human right must be paired with online security, privacy, and safety. If that is not done, the new digital global economy will continue to perpetuate the old age manifestation of widespread social exclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, please. Yes, to me, basically the beauty of the global digital compact process is the opportunity that especially small island development states will get through with this process. And whenever something doesn't exist, you have the opportunity to create it. So I think that should be the point of departure that we are going to use right now. A lot of times, especially SITS, we are looking, you know, we, we, we think that, that we are victims 
But now we have the opportunity to come at the table and to come with meaningful suggestions. And as, as Mr. Taylor did mention, of course, you may have to do maybe some lobbying with, with others, but at least if you have something on paper, then people can discuss about it. So I think this is the opportunity for us to put something on, on paper and let others give comments regarding what we have, um, have been drafting. Most of the times they draft things and we just give comments. So I think we, we should reverse this right now. We should draft um, in which direction we think uh, um, we should go this whole global digital compact process and let others give comments on what we think the, the direction that, that we should go. So I think if we do that, at least we, we may have a big chance that at least our voices are being heard and that we can make a meaningful impacts and changes in our nations. Thank you. And over back to you, uh, Joel. Thank you, Michelle. Is the GDC positioned to address the shortcomings of the IGF process? And if so, what are the opportunities and mechanisms to address these shortcomings? Um, I'm going to start back with you, Michelle, online. Let our um, online panelists get in the first word in this one. OK, great. Um, Sharon, would you go first, please, and then Otis? Yes, okay. Um, I, I think when we talk about when we talk about shortcomings of the IGF process, again, it's very important to for us to to identify what happened back then with 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 the IGF, you know. So the I mean, the way how we have been approaching or looking at the IGF nowadays, it, it was that was not the original intention of the IGF. The IGF was more like a uh, a talking place where people can discuss ideas with not, um, let's say, to take significant decisions right in those in those rooms, but to have the discussions ongoing. So I'm not sure if we should say, if we look at that, if we can say that there were some shortcomings, because it was not it was not meant to be like that, you know. So. Um, I mean, if, if you look at the at the original objectives, they, they, they were met in one way or the other. But 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 I believe, as I did mention before, it's nice to have discussions regarding opportunities and challenges that we're facing. But at the end of the day, we would like to see actions um, taking being taken place in, in our in our countries. And that's basically what what we can see with um, let's say with this um, next. Um, approach, and I think um, that, 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 as I did mention before, that 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 would be a big, a great opportunity for us to, to to come with meaningful suggestions in order for us to achieve things, and not only to keep discussions in a closed room, that cannot help us with anything. So that that would be the way how I would like to to look at it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shannon. Um, Otis, please. Yes. Yes, it is my view that the potential of the GDC far outweighs ways that of the um, the IGF due to the GDC being a UN directive or, or policy per se. Now, I agree with Sharon uh, that because when I look, when I think about it, for example, the IGF discussions on best practices in securing the internet seem to have been, for the most part, just discussions, right? As the best practices are seriously being implemented, most ISPs and network operators have not adopted, for example, the manners actions to secure data being routed through the internet. We have two ISPs, Digicel and, and Flow. And when I check if they are members of the um of Manners, Digicel was the only one. And they have not adopted all the actions. 
right? So there are still some gaps. When I look at, um, again, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies, and SMEs, health and financial and educational institutions, most of them have not implemented cost-free DNS SEC and IPv6 standards to secure digital transactions and other internet-based activities. I, I use um, internet.nl to check if um, our cybersecurity incident response team, if their URL is, is, um, is secure, and they have not implemented DS, DNSSEC. And, and they are the they are the um, implementing agency and advisory for the government and other institutions and organizations within the Jamaican um, within Jamaica, right? So I think that in conclusion, the GDC could eliminate the shortcomings, and I'm talking about a lot of action of the IGF by maybe elevating or expanding the IGF to an implementation, monitoring, and maybe even an enforcement coalition of country-based IGFs. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Otis. Yeah, some, I guess, very powerful um, uh, uh, thoughts about yes. at least certainly the situation in Jamaica. Thank you very much, Misha. Thank I'm going to come yes. now to my on-site panel. I'm going to start with you, uh, Rodney. Your thoughts on is the GDC position to address the shortcomings of the IGF process? And if so, what are the opportunities and mechanisms to address those shortcomings? Thank you very much, Joel. Well, if we were to believe Otis, um, it is going to be an amazing opportunity to fix all the problems we have. <laughs> sorry, Otis, sorry <laughs> to take that job at you. Um, <laughs> But I, I, th th those are really high expectations, and um, I, I don't see the GDC addressing those things because they're not easy things to address to start with. Um, there's no UN compact that will force those operators to implement these measures. Um, uh, we can encourage, we provide, like you said, best practice. Um, but at the level of the United Nations, it, that is, we don't see that, that happening. The compact, I mean, there are so many other things, if you look at it globally, if you look at the geopolitics globally, even in things of climate change, where there, there's clear evidence that action needs to be taken, and um, still um, the, the UN struggles to, to get the world to respond. Um, things like... Um, human trafficking and so on. So the internet is just another one of those very complicated things that the world is just trying to make sure that there's a mechanism for collaborating. And that's what the GDC is, in my view, another mechanism. There are advantages, like I said, for addresses the shortcomings, as in, well, it gives, it has the potential to give small states a stronger voice. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult. I, I, I wish, um, you know, the tech envoy success, he's been tasked with that responsibility and we've been actively participating and supporting. But it is no means, I mean, as Tracy pointed out, it is not yet. And let's hope that they, they, there are some positive outcomes. But we welcome it and we think there is an opportunity to strengthen the IGF process to work along with and um, achieve better outcomes for the world generally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Thank you. I think I'll take a step back a bit and try to, I don't know, I think we sometimes need a bit more clarity in discussions. For instance, in this specific case, I don't think it's necessarily fair to put the GDC and the IGF, you know, um, in a comparison situation because the IGF is a process and the GDC is supposed to be at the end of 2024 a document, right? So if we were to be a little more fair, it would be comparing the GDC, which as Tracy was saying, we don't really have with the Tunis agenda, which was the starting point for the IGF. 
So uh, leaving that aside, yes, we do need a bit more clarity into that. Um, shortcomings of the IGF, sure, no process is perfect and definitely um, IGF has not been a perfect process, but we have seen over the 18 years that it has improved and it has shown willingness to change, to adapt to the changing um, technological landscape and to respond to some of these challenges. We had a few sessions back then, now we have look at so many happening uh, right, now, right now in parallel. We have all the international activities, um, best practice forum policy networks and a lot around that, the parliamentary track and all these attempts to try to do something. Um, again, it's not a perfect process, there can be improvements. Um, as Rodney was saying, ideally the GDC would build a bit on that um, and see how to strengthen the IGF. We have also had all these discussions in the past about IGF+. Plus and there was a lot of endorsement of that whole concept. Um, we haven't seen much follow-up on that. Uh, let's see if the GDC could uh, build on it. And I think all of us have heard throughout this week um, at the IGF how many have said, well, let's see how the IGF itself can serve as some sort of a follow-up uh, mechanism for the GDC um, itself. I won't go into the third question because um, I was close to that. But uh, <laughs> yes, let, let's look a bit at things um, this way, how we can bring things together instead of um, yeah, just trying to see how new things might be solving problems of um, things that have existed. Thank you, Serena. Tracy? All right, this is me, not Bart. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, so just building on what I said before, I, th I do think the opportunities are there to raise the profile and um, something I had spoken about in a session yesterday about outreach. So we expect, we, we're sitting in Kyoto or wherever we are and we expect things to just happen. People to come, you know, somehow the UN system, things just come to us, come to us and talk. But maybe it should be the other way around. So maybe the GDC can go the other direction and allow, allow it to reach into the, the community is getting back to the SIDS specific issues, reach into SIDS and say, look, this is something we, we are bringing to the table to help improve your, your existence and your, your circumstances and um, tell us what you need. And perhaps there's an opportunity there for better dialogue. If it's a, if it's a compact, you know, the word compact means something in, it, 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 in the English language. It's you know, some sort of you know, promise to deliver, promise to work together. Um, it's 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 you know also a handshake almost. So if that's what it is, and we don't don't know what it is yet, if that's what it is, then I think there's a real opportunity there to have the UN system reach into and reach out to uh, small and developing states, into the stakeholders, and and make things um, happen. We not we don't see a lot of that I think with other digital activities, so that's good that it could happen that way. Um, so besides you know, funding interventions and so on, there may be opportunities for real skills and knowledge transfer, real capacity development in those um, territories, and also to work with governments to ensure that, as I said, the priorities of these issues are brought higher up on the agenda. So Otis's concerns about cybersecurity, which I think the broader issues, you know, in terms of resilience, can be brought further up on the agenda because we, we can't just sit here and talk about it's not happening and not make it happen, right? So it's not happening, right? But what do we do to, to make it happen? So maybe this is an opportunity to have that happen. So I see a lot of promise in that regard, and I hope that Tech Envoy is here, that he's listening and hearing what we're saying because I think that's what we're trying to say. Don't sit in the, the New York and Geneva or wherever, um, Riyadh, Kyoto, wherever we are, and talk about it, let's go there, let's make it happen, let's get, you know, rub the sleeves, get it done, and just remember, I always tell, tell people, yes, it's the internet, yes, we are connected, but not everyone is connected. So don't assume that we can just do a Zoom call and make it happen either. We may have to get there and do it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tracy. As we say in our region, enough of the long talk. Yeah. <laughs> Quentin? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I love that, Tracy. And uh, in fact, with uh, certain topics, that is exactly the approach that the Tech Envoy is proposing, which we're calling a multi-stakeholder networked approach. Uh, so for example, with the high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence, which will be formed in the next couple of weeks, 
the recruitment process was extremely open and we received more than 1,800 nominations. It was an open call, public call on the website. And in fact, um, some of the nominations from SIDS countries were self-nominations. And um, the, multi the multi-stakeholder networked approach to consultations, what we're planning to do is um, have those members of the body go out into different networks that they already are members of and try and reach in, like you say, and try and understand the needs, understand the concerns, understand the expertise, um, and bring them back into the political process. Because that's the thing that can be done kind of, uh, let's say, outside of New York, uh, outside of the intergovernmental chambers, um, but get that information expertise in there and shape the decision. Maybe coming to the main question around the shortcomings of the IGF, I mean, what I've heard in this panel and generally is there seem to be two huge like challenges. One is around the absence of decision making and the other is around the overwhelm and the, you know, the vast uh, capacity gap in keeping track of everything going on. And what it, whether a GDC can address these two issues really um, depends. So obviously, you know, from the Secretary General's perspective, he would like to have a very ambitious GDC, uh, one that unifies the UN system in providing support and gets, you know, the UN agencies, which are all around the world, working on some of the country level issues, and also one which builds bridges between countries on issues like cross-border commerce, you know, the moratorium on, on, on moratorium on tariffs on e-commerce, um, the trade revenue and, and taxation that it may not be happening and which if it were happening would help build public sector capacity more endogenously. Um, these are not specific proposals of the Secretary General, but these are concerns which need to be voiced by those countries who have them. Um, concerns around you know, social, economic and cultural rights, for example, authorship and uh, intellectual property over uh, media content that may have been produced and exported and now that can be done using AI. Um, these kinds of concerns uh, need to be lifted up and presented in a unified voice. And when I say it depends, you know, the ambition level to get to those beyond just principles in the GDC towards and beyond just objectives to actions and commitments where there is some kind of uh, uh, promise uh, to actually deliver something, there needs to be a unified voice and among uh, you know, the countries in, whom, in whose interests it is. And so one of the things um, we've been observing is that because delegations are so overstretched in New York, they are, and because they're so overwhelmed with, uh, you know, or let's say their inboxes are overflowing with uh, more urgent issues around debt relief, uh, around um, some of the basic um, economic issues, the SDGs, um, you know, not on track yet with the SDGs, uh, sometimes they're overlooking the significance of digital. And because digital is one of the growing sectors in the digital economy, I mean, th the digital economy is one of the growing sectors and will continue to be, um, this is a real opportunity for the future. So the challenge is how can countries kind of look up from the immediate crisis they're in and think about um, how the digital architecture is going to look a few years down the line and how their role is going to be within that. Um, so... I'll come back to the issue of, uh, of stretched capacity, maybe in the final question, but um, one of the questions around review and follow-up on any commitments that are reached in the GDC is to what extent uh, governments and others can participate in that. Um, so I'll come back to that point. Thank you very much for that, Quentin. And now you, Olga? Thank you very much. I, uh, most of my, my thoughts are already addressed by my colleagues in, in the table. But um, I, I would like to uh, build upon what Serena said, that n not I, I don't find it totally fair to compare the IGF with the GDC. I find some commonalities in between the two processes. I think one of the beauties of the IGF is the equal footing. 
that the, it may be this chaos that you can find the been surf walking in a corridor and take a picture with him, or you can find colleagues from other countries that you uh, didn't have the opportunity to meet before. So th that beauty, I think, it's it's remarkable from IGF. Other meetings are more structured, which is true. Um, and perhaps this variety of activities, and we run from one meeting to the other one, trying to find the room, uh, makes us find what we didn't think we were going to find. So that, that is something uh, which I find interesting. What I like from GDC is uh, that it seems to be a bottom-up process. Um, what I have seen lately is uh, the kind of a tendency of establishing uh, more closed multilateral processes. And I think that the way forward is multi-stakeholder. Uh, that's it's the only way to solve all the problems related with digital economy, digital the, the impact of uh, digitalization in developing countries or in the in the whole countries or uh, cross data flow and all the problems that uh, problems or things that we have to think about is uh, is in a multi stakeholder way. So all the processes that are multi stakeholder, I think they are the way and not multilateral. Whether the, the delegations could be prepared for that. Uh, I've been advisor to the Ministry for the first 20 years, so I know how, how the dynamics in, in, in the different um, um, delegations work. And sometimes there is a, there is a gap in between what happens uh, in the ground at the country and what goes to United Nations in, uh, for example, a multilateral meeting. So um, um, also, the fact that we can contribute in a bottom-up process, as uh, the, the GDC is, is uh, or the opportunity that it brings, is to th reflect on things and think about in deep in, in all the seven different issues that, that it establishes. So I think there is value there. No problem will be solved, but uh, we will think about how to solve them. Thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, specifically from a SIDS perspective, what are the real benefits these vulnerable countries can derive from the GDC? And is the GDC a duplication of current processes? And should the IGF process and GDP, GDC be kept separate or should they be an evaluation, an evolution of one to the other? I know that's a lot, but I'm gonna start with you, Rodney. Thanks. Um, right, so we've heard that it's not fair to compare the two. <laughs> But, um, okay, so let me try to dissect. Um, so the benefits, the reality is that there's still a, a lot of global inequality in the digital space, right? There's, we talk about this, um, not sure what the latest figure is, but two point something billion people not connected. I, I'm sure the majority of those are in developing countries. Some certainly are in small island developing countries. So there is an opportunity to, to focus on this issue a bit more in the Global Digital Compact and um, help in the connectivity and the infrastructural issues and, and SIDS by drawing greater attention to this issue globally and giving it priority within um, a body such as the United Nations. Uh, and that's good for us, like I said, because we tend to play stronger, that is my assessment, within the multilateral processes and within spaces like the UN um, and so on as sovereign states. <coughs> the GDC, though, um, I, it's, it's not a duplication of the process because it is it is meant to be a compact, like the Trace said, a global handshake. This is what we are going to how we're going to move together globally on some of these key issues like cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and so on. Now, it might lead to an, a process, and I think there's been some discussion about the digital global form or something of this sort. So, a sort of um, an expansion of the role of IGF, or maybe even a, a parallel process altogether, if you can imagine, um, showing up for another one of these, perhaps the following week in Australia or someplace, <laughs> it would be very difficult for us to follow. So let's hope that, that it doesn't uh, evolve that way and that there is, that th and clearly there's synergies. Even though we talk about internet governance, clearly the issues go beyond the internet itself. There are issues that are being discussed of human rights and artificial intelligence there. So there's not just the internet that we're talking about. And therefore we don't need to create a whole new process and for people to follow and and um, more meetings um, just to add the word digital <laughs> to a process, frankly speaking. So um, it is not a quite process yet. It is leading towards the summit of the future. We're actively participating 
Um, and we think there's an opportunity for us to lend our voices to ensure that there isn't, we talk about internet fragmentation, but internet governance fragmentation so that, um, again, th we go off on two separate tracks to deal with this. Thank you. <laughs> Too many mics around, sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, no, I agree with Rodney. Um, we shouldn't probably look at the GDC as an application because, well, the goal is to come up with a compact. Um, I was reading the other day the compact for migration. That could be an interesting um, example for the, the GDC to look at. You know, it has clear commitments, clear actions to implement those commitments and then a follow-up process. Um, so no duplication there. There are models to follow. Uh, the discussion, as Rodney was also saying, I think we've been seeing again over the past few days at the IGF about whether we can use the IGF as some sort of follow-up mechanism for the GDC itself. And this whole idea of a um, new forum, I think it was in the UN Secretary General Policy Brief, the Digital Cooperation Forum, it has been discussed quite um, a lot over the past few days, so I won't go into that. But as Quentin was saying earlier, uh, whatever decision is made, I think a few things should be kept in, kept in mind. Are people, countries, um, governments, other stakeholders having the resources available to follow multiple processes that more or less would be uh, tackling similar or complementary issues? Are there resources to fund more than one process looking into these issues? And then at the end of the day, what would happen with uh, the outcomes of all these uh, processes? Do we bring them together at some point somewhere? Uh, yeah, just a few things to, to consider as a discussion on the Global Digital um, Compact advance. So ideally, we do find ways for things to work together rather than um, create competition for resources. Thank you. Tracy? Thank you. So I did ask Bard and GP ChatGPT this one because I don't know as well. <laughs> and they agreed. They agreed. They said that um, the way they use it was complementary. So that's interesting that they, they have agreed on that together so that it, so that um, it seems as if um, the, the, uh, the AI models seem to agree that this is going to work well. Um, so that's useful. Um, in my own opinion, though, um, again, I'm trying to, so there's something in the Caribbean called plain talk, bad manners. So at the IGF, again, unfair comparison, um, the voice of SIDS is not very loud, and the volume is also not very loud. So in terms of numbers and in terms of representation, even when there are attempts to actually, you know, to, to, to request representation, um, it seems to be that we get lost in the crowd. So um, to a large extent, in the Latin American Caribbean space, Caribbean is silent in the LAC space, Pacific is silent in the AP space, Asia Pacific space, and Indian Oceans are silent in the African space. Not for lack of trying. Um, larger countries dominate, and that's the way it works. So in the IGF space where that is, seems to be happening, in, in, the, in the SIDS discussion, I think a GDC might actually improve that, uh, this kind of getting back to Rodney's uh, idea of the one country, one vote process. So again, being very, very plain talk by manners here, I do think that there's an opportunity in the GDC process to, r to get SID's points across more specifically because we have a more equitable voice there. Um, I can't seem, we can't seem to fix it in the IGF. I've been trying for years. Can't seem to fix it, so let's fix it with the GDC. Simple as, simple as that. I think that's, that's something that I will want to see happen. And if the IGF <coughs> process sees that happening, maybe they may also wish to bring the SIDS along in their process and not have the same voices, the same countries, and the large groups of people dominating the smaller voices every year. So I think that's something I want to say. I'm saying it here. It's a good form to say it in. And I hope that we'll fix that with the GDC process. Plain talk, bad manners. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tracy. I'm going to ask the panel to, for their indulgence, uh, Ms. Carol Roach from the Bahamas. She is with us in the room, and she has to leave, so I want to give her an opportunity to say a few words before she has to go. Carol? Uh, good morning, everybody, and 
I suppose, early, early afternoon or late afternoon in, in different countries. Um, thank you for indulging me. Uh, Carol Roach from the Bahamas, new um, MAG chair. Um, key words that I heard here are the, is the word action, 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 action. So we need to put pen to paper, as one of the speakers said, and say what we want. Um, write a letter. If you want me to present it to the high-level panel, I will do so. They are actually looking for input, especially on um, why you come here every year, even though it seems like Sid's not being heard, but you come every year. Why is it that you come every year? Um, what you would like to be, what you want to be seen um, more, what you want improvements on, what's your take on the GDC? And they want this in writing so that they could forward it to the co-facilitators. So I encourage you to do so. Um, the second thing is capacity building. Um, if we're gonna have our parliamentarians or whoever, our missions go forward to make a vote or to negotiate, they need to know what they're negotiating. I gave the, an example, well, let me not use my country because <laughs> next thing I might not get back in. But, <laughs> but I, I think that a lot of times persons in missions, they go to meetings, they take notes. If you're not a technology person or a human rights person or so on, sometimes those notes mean nothing to, to people. You would find that those notes come to the relevant department when it's time for your government to make a decision and to give their input and to sign. It's not fair. We have to start now in preparing our parliamentarians, our missions, so somehow we need to get funding, we need to push the IGF to uh, get some capacity building at that level. So those are just the two things that um, I have to say and I am definitely here for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Carol. Um, I'm not sure if you're going off to another meeting. Yes, I know how it goes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, still continuing with question three, I come to you now, Quinton. Um, yeah, so what can be the real benefits of a GDC? And maybe uh, um, I can pick up this question around review and follow-up. So, you know, obviously, again, it's speculative, but if there are there is an ambitious GDC with commitments and actions, then how is it reviewed and followed up? And maybe I can just take a moment to explain the proposal by the Secretary General for creating a space for that to happen, um, because that then speaks to how you know the IGF might relate to that space, how other fora might relate to that space. And it was named Digital Cooperation Forum. Uh, the name doesn't matter that much, uh, but the concept is that uh, it's a space for review and follow up, and this could address three different issues. Uh, the first is the issue of gaps in the existing digital governance landscape for considering issues like AI governance, human rights, things like mis- and disinformation. And what this central place could be is a place for pooling all of those issues. So internet governance issues that emerge through the IGF could then be injected in there. In fact, the Secretary General uh, created this IGF leadership panel to serve as a bridge or a channel from the IGF into the UN processes. Um, and then, you know, other initiatives like the HR human rights uh, advisory mechanism or uh, the AI advisory body can also feed into this kind of space uh, for review and follow up. So it addresses some of the gaps. The second thing this uh, would address is this issue of capacity and fragmented governance. And actually having one place where countries can come together to look at issues defragments the governance. By bringing all the strands into one place, it allows countries to focus in a holistic way on digital governance issues instead of running around the world from meeting to meeting, chasing off you know all these different discussions, which some of which may or may not lead to decisions. And then uh, the third thing it does is I would say it kind of
preserves and protects the special characters of these different areas. Um, I was I did not come, but Chengatai showed me the video of the music night here on I think it was day one or day two. Um, and it seems to me, you know, I've heard the word creative chaos <laughs> associated with IGF. It does seem, as the first timer at IGF, there is a special spirit to IGF where there is this feeling where, you know, um, there's an organic feeling to it where free discussions can be had on, you know, being impolite, but, uh <laughs> you know, saying what we feel. And those are very important, especially when it comes to technical discussions and the technical community where it really needs to solve problems quickly. And... Um, one risk and concern of bringing these politicized discussions around hate speech, misinformation, human rights, AI governance um, into places like the IGF, uh, you know, data protection and exploitation, is that it can suddenly change the feeling of the discussion and, you know, change the spirit of IGF. And so um, for these three reasons, you know, this new proposal to have a space to review and follow up GDC actions and commitments, addressing the gaps that the existing fora do not meet because of technological developments, defragmenting the governance so that countries who have limited resources can concentrate them on the, the central place where they can see everything and participate with a strong voice in everything, and preserving the unique character and the spirit of IGF. This is possible, but it's only possible if there is ambition and unity among the member states, those countries who have an interest. Perhaps SIDS sees itself as one of those kind of groupings. And if so, um, it would be very good to see those voices being you know, raised loud in the GDC process so that uh, uh, those interests can be reflected in the outcome document. Thank you. Um, okay, very interesting what you said. So you you missed the music. Uh, you didn't see me singing. You didn't see me singing. Oh, that's 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 remarkable. <laughs> you can say <laughs> it's a joke. I'm joking. I, I did sing, but uh, okay. I think it's it's very. I, I love music, and I think the music is is really uh, a way to bridge any gap. Um, and and it's interesting what you mentioned that bringing gaps, uh, bridging gaps uh, in between the different processes is very challenging for, especially for developing countries, having human resources to follow all these processes. What we have done at the Argentina level in my times of working for the government and as an academic is trying to arrange meetings where we all gather together with the delegates that then will participate. But at the same time, these processes are multiplicating and sometimes the delegations are overwhelmed, especially countries that don't have bigger delegations. So that is that is challenging. What we have also found as useful is working at the regional level, for example, in, in between countries of Mercosur, which is Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and, and um, Brazil, um, working with uh, as, uh, associations, internet association, or different associations for telecommunications or or technical bodies. Uh, it is it is challenging, but. Um, as far as I understand, the process is, is towards um, some co coordination or concentration of, 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 uh, of all these processes, so that would be beneficial, even though I think the, the, the beauty of the IGF should be preserved. Thank you for those comments and that contribution, Olga. I'll go over to Misha and our online panelists. Yes, thank you. Um, Otis, can we hear from you? Um, first on the same question, and then uh, Sharon, please. Okay, thank you, Michelle. All right. I'm gonna begin by cautiously saying that no one can dispute the power and influence of UN directives, and um, that SIDS governments will follow through eventually especially since uh, digital economy has been touted as a means of realizing the 2030 SDGs. However, discussions at the UN level and at the UN level are exclusive, a level so high and out of touch that a startup entrepreneur 
or a university student, unless, of course, it's a research paper, right? An assignment would not say to themselves, let's see what's being discussed and proposed at the UN today. The objectives of the IGF are still relevant, though duplicated by the GDC. The IGF is in a unique position to reach everyone from grassroots people and businesses to corporations. IGF is more relatable as internet governance forms part, part of its name. In fact, at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, first year students conduct research and write a report on internet governance topics as their first assignment in their Introduction to Computer Essentials course. And one of those topics include generative AI, such as ChatGPT. The importance of internet governance can become real for these students because they, in addition to civil society, and businesses, and I'm talking about small, medium-sized businesses, can join a national IGF chapter and become part of the process rather than become mere mentions in the mass of texts in the GDC policy paper. Thank you. Thanks. I'm um, Shannon, please. Yes, I think by now we have been discussing IGF. We know more or less what is the IGF after, let's say, um, 18 years. The GDC is still something that needs to be developed. So we, we're not sure, we're not certain what it is as yet. But I think it's very important for us to, whatever process we would like to focus on, the people must become better of what we're trying to do. And with the people in this particular case, we are focusing on the SITs. So SITs must become better. So whatever direction we are heading, our people in the region, small island development states, they must become better of the process that we are going to focus on. And I think at the end of the day, if we can focus on, let's say, um, economic, especially economic development, that, that is very important. We, we know that, for example, the GDC will be focusing on the SDGs 8, 9, and 10, focusing on jobs, economic growth, and infrastructure. So th these are the areas that we should be focusing on because these are the needs that we, that we are having in our, in our jurisdictions. And not to forget, let's say, the big challenge that we're seeing nowadays with respect to climate change, natural disasters, hurricanes, um, and so on. Because it doesn't make sense if we continue to build all these infrastructures and we don't, I mean, we, we cannot fight against nature to a certain extent. But while we are trying to build infrastructure and then climate change can just destroy everything in just a few seconds. So we need to find the right balance, how we can, while we are still trying to focus on the SDGs 8, 9, and 10, to focus a bit on climate change as well. And not to forget, let's say, um, collaboration, partnership, which is um, the SDG 17 that I haven't heard be mentioning um, today, but I think it's also very important for us to focus on. And in addition to that, what I already did mention, we know more or less what our problems are. Let's start focusing, identify them, and to see how we can bring solutions in collaboration to others to for our very specific problems that we are facing. So that's basically what I wanted to share. Thank you. 
Thank you. Back to you, Joel. Thank you very much, Michelle. We're now going to open the floor for questions and comments from those in the audience and those online as well. Uh, for those on site, please go to the microphone, state your name and the organization you represent, and make your comment, your contributions. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mahesh Perra from Sri Lanka, a small island in the South Asia region. Uh, actually, we have been uh, doing our digital, I mean, this forum is all about equitable framework for developing countries on digital transformation. So, I mean, uh, now, in, when it comes to Sri Lanka, now we have been doing many uh, digital strategies over the last 20 years, two decades, but the country is uh, yet to achieve many things. But now we see uh, IGF, uh, CD, uh, the digital, what do you call, uh, Global Digital Compact, and WSIS, even, um, I mean, many other you know, international platforms are trying to set standards, you know, what to achieve to make citizen uh, uh, satisfied, I mean, in terms of citizen-centric government, to build citizen-centric government, citizen-centric nations, uh, to, uh, to leapfrog from where we are to, to the next level. Now, uh, when you see these standards, they talk about on what aspect, but hardly they talk about who and, you know, uh, how aspect. So when it comes to my suggestion uh, and the request from the esteemed panel, is, uh, is there any way that we could talk more on who aspect as well as how aspect? You know, who is supposed to do these things? Because the government, if you take the my government, the government is busy with you know, fighting the status quo, I mean the operational activities. I mean, who should drive these initiatives? Because now when it comes to Sri Lanka, now we already have a new digital strategy, uh, digital transformation strategy. But now over the last two decades, we implemented, but there are many gaps. Now who should drive these initiatives? Is it a one government organization or multiple organization who should drive? Can't we have sort of frameworks or best practices into these guidelines? And then when it comes to uh, the how aspect, how we should do it, whether we should do it with the local uh, parliaments, whether, whether local parliament should get involved in monitoring and evaluation on these measures, or how, how we should uh, establish now when it comes to SDGs. Now how we are going to make these uh, initiatives sustainable, you know, over the long run and to bring the, bring the citizen, you know, uh, in the forefront and keep citizens uh, satisfied, fulfilled in all these initiatives. So I, my concern is who and how aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nigel? Thank you, Jewel. I'm Nigel Casimir, um, Deputy Secretary General for the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Um, I rushed to follow the gentleman from Sri Lanka because um, the comment I wanted to make, I think, would fall straight in, into the, the, the issues that he's raising. We, I, I heard comments about um, identifying shortcomings of the IGF and so on. <coughs> But there's also some good, good from the IGF. And one of the things I think is good from the IGF was the outreach and the development of this network of national and regional initiatives. Because maybe some issues might be global, but many issues are regional or national, as the case might be. So in terms of the, the what and the who and the, and, and the how, it's not a one-size-fits-all answer. So I would suggest as well, um, Quinton talked about the GDC establishing some sort of a coordination mechanism. I'm gonna suggest that there should be some outreach in that as well, right? And maybe some encouragement of national and regional type of initiatives in the same, in the same vein, so that these groups can share with one another Right, and maybe find some common principles and maybe find some special principles that might not apply globally. Right? But um, I think that particular aspect of the outreach is a, is a, a key point, a, a key benefit out of the, out of the IGF, and uh, we should keep that in mind in, in any of the implementations um, coming out of the GDC. One last thing I'll say since we're focusing on SIDS is that one might say SIDS is a... a and a, an interest group, and it is, because there are these special things. But even within SIDS, it's not all one size fits all, 
right? Because one thinks about the Caribbean, the Caribbean, small islands, and so on. One thinks about the Pacific, small islands spread out. But the scale is not comparable, right? Whereas we might have populations that might be comparable, the distances we're talking about are not. It's a lot easier to make a business case in the Caribbean for something like submarine cable than in the, in the, in the Pacific. So the local aspects of the problems and solutions need to be taken into account and we need to structurally build that into whatever we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Nigel. Yes, please, uh, and please keep it short. We've got like five minutes yeah, left, uh, and I still want to get some takeaways from the panel. Uh, very quickly, I'm Samir from Sri Lanka, uh, working for the largest telecom company, uh, so we see what's going on on the uh, data side. So I was going through the uh, uh, digital compact uh, policy brief. You know, I, I came, I caught my attention, uh, um, uh, something caught my attention uh, very interesting. It's data divide. Uh, it says uh, data flow will grow by 400% by 2026. Uh, the uh, negative side of it is developing countries uh, risk becoming mere providers. Uh, maybe seen seen as a telco, you know, telecom company and sitting in the data. We see to some extent as well. My question to you know the panelists uh, is the experts' views on uh, the GDC. Uh, what are the kind of interventions uh, you see to you know handle this uh, data divide? What's mentioned in the policy brief? Uh, Rodney, I'm going to let you take it, and I'm just getting my wrap up. We've got three minutes. <laughs> okay, I, I think Quinton may be more versed with specifically on the provisions of the GDC with respect to the last question. So I would like to say, in relation to the previous question, that um, I think the, th the saying is you think global and not local. So, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, we talk about global cooperation, but it is really for national parliaments to go back and, and we are necessary in trying these things into law. Um, Otis mentioned, for example, the mutually agreed norms for, for routing cybersecurity. This has to be implemented, not even just locally, but at the level of, say, the operators um, and the internet service providers. So um, I think the point is that while we talk, we discuss, we agree on global agreements and so on, it is really for us to go back and do what we need to do to implement. Um, so I don't know exactly. if you want to. Yeah, exactly. I don't think we have enough time because I just got a three minute wrap up. So um, I really want to thank everyone for coming. A special thanks to our panelists, uh, Mr. Rodney Taylor, the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, uh, Ms. Olga Kavali, co-founder and director of South School on Internet Governance, Mr. Quinton Shu Lambert, uh, Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, Tracy Hackshaw, President Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, uh, Serena Tenan, Director of Knowledge at the Diplo Foundation, to our online panelists, Mr. Otis Osborne, Department of Information Technology at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, and Mr. Shernan Osepa, Internet Governance and Cybersecurity Policy Advisor, and also our online moderator, Michelle Marius. Thank you so much. The things with conversations like this is they always leave you wanting so much more, and we're all here for today is the last, so please make sure you exchange numbers and contacts so that we can keep these conversations going. I'm Joe Ford, your moderator. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.